but until they see it, until they watch, it becomes real then. That's why, by the way, she happens to be in Asia for me right now, but that's why we have a female vice president of the United States of America who's going to be, we're going to have some presidents pretty soon. Welcome to the Crypto Teacher. And guys, you know, I come back with that video just to make you think. And yes, the movie continues. We have Biden says until they see it and until they watch it, then it becomes real. And we know exactly what he meant about that. Those who follow my channel, those who read my new road order book, you know, I give you the truth. Nothing but the truth. Yes, but the truth sets you free. And the Afghan movie continues. Now the Afghans are going to crypto. I'm surprised they don't have them buying Bitcoin in a cave, guys. Now, basically, they're going to Bitcoin to avoid bank runs, to avoid the legacy rails, to avoid inflation. Sounds familiar, guys? Yes, it does. We know the movie continues. And then also, guys, we know the Fed is about to announce tapering. We know this is going to be a controlled collapse to get us into the fourth industrial revolution so the robots, algorithms, and drones can rise. The fall of Babylon and the rise of China, because we know when it comes to the new world order, it's all planned out. Y'all have a wonderful day. I'm in more than three months, but some crypto investors aren't just looking to make a profit. In Afghanistan, citizens are buying crypto as a way to safeguard their money while fleeing the country. For those that stay, they see it as a way to avoid bank runs and even provide for their families. Fellow host Mackenzie Segalos explains how Afghans are taking advantage of crypto's decentralized status. So the last week has laid bare the worst case scenario for a country that's running on legacy financial rails. You've got a nationwide cash shortage, closed borders, a local currency that's been touching record lows, and not to mention rapidly rising prices of basic goods. And that's why some Afghans I spoke to are turning to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin. Some people leaving the country are using their crypto wallets as a way to bring their money with them. Others see crypto as a way to stay put. I spoke with Farhan Hotak, who lives in a rural part of the country, a village called Zabul. And up until this last week, one way that he would make money was by day trading altcoins like Doge. I spoke to another person, Musa Ramin, who says that he can make more money in crypto in a month than in construction in a year. They also say it's a safer store of value than the local Afghani currency. One thing to keep in mind though, unlike the rest of the crypto sphere, a lot of Afghans dealing in Bitcoin aren't talking about it. But the data shows that widespread adoption of crypto is definitely catching on. Chainalysis put out its annual global crypto adoption index in the last few days, and it gave Afghanistan a rank of 20 out of the 154 countries it evaluated in terms of overall crypto adoption. And when you isolate for its peer-to-peer -peer exchange trade volume, Afghanistan jumps up to seventh place. Last year, Afghanistan's crypto presence was considered so minimal as to entirely exclude it from the 2020 ranking. Now, while the data is promising, major barriers to mass adoption remain. Beyond the fact that there is limited access to the internet and frequent power outages, a vast majority of the country is unbanked, meaning that they don't have access to the global economy from inside of Afghanistan. So the on and off ramps to the crypto world from Afghanistan are anything but straightforward. Let's turn now uh, to the turmoil in Afghanistan the past week. It's now dealing with a cash shortage, closed borders, rapid inflation, a plunging security. The situation in the country could prove to be a perfect test case for the usefulness of crypto. CNBC.com's Mackenzie Segalos is here with that story for us. Mackenzie? So, Kelly, the last week has laid bare the worst case scenario for a country running on legacy financial rails. You have people who are running out of cash. The Western Union has suspended all services. And that's part of why some Afghans I spoke to are turning to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Now, some people are leaving the country and what they're doing is they're using their crypto wallets to bring their money with them. Others see crypto as a way to stay put. I spoke with Farhan uh, McKenzie. I love your name, by the way, because it's my son's name. Um, but <laughs> it's great. Is Bitcoin, for those people who are there, are they safe holding Bitcoin? What if the Taliban showed up at their door after this story 
and knock, 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 and said, I hear you've got a lot of Bitcoin. Give me your password or I'll shoot you. So unlike the rest of the crypto sphere, a lot of Afghans dealing in Bitcoin or Ethereum aren't talking about it. And part of that has to do with the uncertainty around how well that will be received. But also the use case is still limited, right? Like it, Afghanistan is very much a cash economy. People need physical bills in hand to buy food. So Bitcoin isn't putting bread on the table tonight. But there are increasing uh, indications of adoption across the country. So Chainalysis just put out new research that shows that in terms of global crypto adoption, Afghanistan ranks number 20. And when you isolate just for their peer-to-peer -peer transactions, it jumps up the ranking to seventh place. Wow. And last year in 2020, Afghanistan didn't even make the list. That's extraordinary. That's amazing. They, they rank number 20 over of all the countries in the world. They are number 20 in terms of penetration in the, in the population. Yes, they do. This, we should note that this ranking adjusts for individual, uh, individual wealth. And so that's why you don't see a country like the U.S. ranking higher. They're trying to avoid looking at gross volume so that they can really understand what the individual use case of, of crypto is uh, within the given country. It's fascinating. So, so, so would the people you, you, you spoke to, would they be in any kind of danger because uh, the Taliban or, or other uh, renegade outfits uh, would, would come to them and, and say, give me your Bitcoin because I want it? So that was less of a concern that came up in the conversations mm -hmm. that I had. The bigger barrier to entry uh, was the fact that the on-ramp to participating in the crypto economy is so tough in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. there is limited internet penetration. There are widespread power outages, not to mention the fact that a lot of people are unbanked. They don't have access to the international banking system. Their, their credit card that they're using in Afghanistan isn't recognized by banks outside of the country. So th those, were, those were more of the issues that came up with regard to the limitations of crypto. Yeah. And you would never know who's listening in on your internet connection, I suppose. Mackenzie, thanks. Thank you. All righty. So markets and not just these top level calls. Why is it that you think the taper triggers a market reset? There's three channels that a taper or slowing of asset purchases works its way through the markets. The one that most economists, strategists, Fed policy participants focus on is the signaling or discounting effect. I think what if we hear anything from Chair Powell this week, it'll be about separating rate hikes from the actual taper process. They'll do everything they can to try and deliver a dovish taper. That's only one of the three channels. The other two that uh, rarely get discussed, the second one is a move higher in real rates. When you discount stocks, uh, you create an equity risk premium model, you use the real interest rate. Even last week, as Fed officials talked more about a potential sept, uh, taper. Steve Leisman reported that's a higher probability. He saw a spike higher in real rates in the front end. That's what happened in the taper tantrum, which was actually the smallest of the equity market corrections, but that, that we had two spikes in real rates in 18 and 19. Hmm. And then the third channel, the one that never gets discussed, Kelly, is the volatility channel. And that is because when the Fed buys mortgages, 100% of the net supply in this case, they suppress mortgage prepayment risk. They don't hedge it. The private sector does need to. And so it causes interest rate volatility to go up. That causes equity volatility to go up. Sure. And that's where these risk off shocks come. We're going to a different economy. And we're going to be learning more about that uh, as we go. But clearly, we're, we're, we're learning that things can be done uh, from remote, remote locations. We're learning that technology can replace people even more than we thought. We're not going back to the same economy. We're going, we're recovering, but to a different economy. And it'll be one that is more leveraged to technology. And I worry that that is going to make it even more difficult than it was for, for many workers. In Silicon Valley and my friends who work in technology know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we are now going to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and then even bookkeepers, accountants, uh, insurance agents, lawyers, and on and on through the economy. So what happened to the manufacturing workers is a very clear sign. This effort 
And China has big plans for this. They intend to seed um, their digital yuan into the global environment by giving it away to visitors at next winter's Olympics. When they arrive at the airport, they're going to get di yuan digital wallets. They're going to receive digital yuan. They're going to use it uh, throughout their visits to Beijing, and then they're going to take it back to their own countries. They see this as a huge advantage. Why? Because who controls the underlying protocols, who un controls the underlying standards of the future of money will control the future of money. The most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation to come, Steve Jobs. And guys, you know I truly believe in this. When you look at the New World Order, they're the storytellers, and that's the reason why I wrote my New World Order book. But guys, now it's time to change the current generation. And I wrote three kids' books. You know I love the Trinity because I understand the power that's in it. So I have three books. We have an opportunity to change the generation, to educate, not just me, but I want to show you that I take action on a daily basis. And I want you to take action on a daily basis. Whether it's your job, whether it's in your community, we have an opportunity right now to educate the masses. I posted this on my Twitter account. Please share, but this is a short clip of the three books. There's going to be a clothing line and action figure. Please get these books for your kids, nephews, cousins, friends. So therefore, we can start the re-education now. Because as we see, the fourth industrial revolution foundation is definitely here. Robots, algorithms, drones, taking humanity out the picture. We have to re-educate. But let's get into the video. Part 1, King Yahshua and Grandma Tim, Save the Village. Part 2, King Yahshua and Grandma Tim, Save New York. Long COVID-33. Part 3, King Yahshua and Grandma Tim, Goes to China. It's mandatory to get Part 1, Part 2, and Part 3 of this series. It's time to re-educate Generation Z.